This is a high yield pediatrics review to increase your score on the pediatric shelf and also for your USMLE exams. So let's begin. First, we'll discuss the renal system. So a Wilms tumor is an asymptomatic abdominal mass that does not typically cross the midline. The most common site of meds is to the lungs, and these patients are typically between the ages of 2 to 5 years. It's also associated with syndromes such as Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome and as well as WAGR or Wager syndrome. In order to treat these patients, you want to do a tumor resection or nephrectomy, and also it might be required that you do chemotherapy and radiation therapy. The USMLE likes to present a scenario of a healthy four-year-old that is generally just asymptomatic, but their parent was bathing or showering them and then they felt this mass. And on physical exam, there is a palpable painless abdominal mass that does not cross the midline. Why that is so important is because they typically want to confuse you between the Wilms tumor and a neuroblastoma. So the neuroblastoma can cross the midline, but in Wilms tumors, they typically do not cross the midline. And the best initial test is an abdominal ultrasound, while the most accurate test is a CT with contrast. What is the next step in management for a child that is found to have isolated proteinuria on urine dipstick? Well, that is to repeat the dipstick testing on two subsequent occasions. If the subsequent tests are negative, the diagnosis is transient proteinuria. If subsequent tests revealed continued proteinuria, then further workup is required. For the pediatric population, examiners love to test proteinuria in the setting of nephrotic syndrome, of course, but they also now like to test isolated proteinuria and transient proteinuria. So it's very important to know the differences between them and what's the next best step to do in these situations. So let's now compare nephrogenic diabetes insipidus versus primary polydipsia. Both of these conditions present with polyuria, polydipsia, and diluted urine. So this is typically where the urine osmolality is less than 300 milliosmoles per kilogram. So how can we differentiate between these two conditions if they have the same presentation or very similar presentation? Well, we can do a water deprivation test. And with the water deprivation test, we're basically just not giving the patient any water for a set period of time and then analyzing how the body reacts to it. We're trying to see why exactly is this urine dilute. Primary polydipsia is due to an excessive water intake, which suppresses ADH. Water deprivation test increases ADH and concentrates urine. So when you think of someone with primary polydipsia, think of someone who is just drinking and drinking and drinking a ton of water. And this excessive water intake causes dilute urine, polydipsia, polyuria. And what's happening is that the ADH is suppressed. So when the ADH is suppressed, we're not able to concentrate urine. But once you do the water deprivation test, the ADH then increases, and of course, the urine concentrates. In nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, this is due to a renal resistance to ADH. So it could be that the body is producing ADH, but we're just not detecting this ADH. So, you know, we're still experiencing the symptoms of the polyuria, polydipsia, and dilute urine. However, once you do the water deprivation test, 
the ADH is increased, but the kidneys are resistant to the ADH. So our bodies are not able to detect this high or increase in ADH in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So the urine remains dilute in this condition. What is interesting though, is that if you do a water deprivation test and the urine remains dilute, honestly, it could be between the nephrogenic diabetes insipidus and central diabetes insipidus. So at this point, you want to administer desmopressin to differentiate between the two. And desmopressin is an ADH analog. So if you give this ADH analog to patients with nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, what will happen is that the urine will still remain dilute. Because like I said, in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, the issues in the name is nephrogenic. Something is wrong with the kidneys. It's not detecting or responding to the ADH that is in the system. So given the des desmopressin analog will change nothing really for these patients. However, in patients with central diabetes insipidus, yes, they would have the same water deprivation test results. However, once you administer the desmopressin, they will start to concentrate their urine. In central diabetes insipidus, these patients have a complete or partial deficiency of ADH. So it's not that their bodies can't respond to it, it's just that their bodies aren't making it or making enough ADH. So once we give the desmopressin or ADH analog, then the urine will start to concentrate in central diabetes insipidus. If you like this type of content so far, please be sure to part that like button, hit subscribe, and that notification bell so that you never ever miss another video like this. Type 1 diabetes. So these patients can present with symptoms like fatigue, polyuria, polydipsia, and signs of dehydration or weight loss. Children can present with this condition between the ages of 4 to 6 years old or at early puberty. It has a bimodal onset in the pediatric population. And the weight loss or dehydration is due to excessive loss of glucose or water. So of course, to treat these patients, we want to give them insulin. So I just wanted to bring up this point because if you see polyuria and polydipsia, don't just think, you know, diabetes alone. Think about, you know, the primary polydipsia, the nephrogenic um, diabetes insipidus, the central diabetes insipidus. Think about all these different differentials and really analyze the information given to you in questions or clinical scenarios in order to lead to the right diagnosis or getting the answers correctly. Membranous nephropathy. So this can be suspected in an adolescent with features of nephrotic syndrome and a hepatitis B infection. When you're prepared for step one and there was a table on the different types of nephropathy and the associated conditions with like sickle cell disease, drug use in African Americans, this is still a very, very high yield concept to know. In membranous nephropathy, basically there is a formation of an antibody immune complex and it's and it can be secondary to infections such as hepatitis B or hepatitis C. It can also be secondary due to autoimmune diseases such as SLE and medications such as NSAIDs or even gold. So on electron microscopy, you can see a spike and dome appearance in membranous nephropathy. In focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, it's common in African-American and Hispanic populations. It's also associated with sickle cell disease and HIV. Very, very high yield to know. In minimal change disease, it's the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in pre-adolescent children less than 10 years old. And this is a T-cell mediated injury of the podocytes. It can be associated with recent infections and immunizations and rarely associated with Hodgkin's lymphoma. And we typically treat with steroids.
What is the likely diagnosis in an African-American patient that presents with painless gross hematuria with numerous intact red blood cells on microscopic exam? Renal papillary necrosis. And this is typically secondary to the sickle cell trait. So these patients have an intact or intact red blood cells because it's not of a glomerular origin. And the relatively low partial pressure of oxygen in the vasa recta of the medulla predisposes red blood cells to sickling, which increases the risk of papillary necrosis. Other causes of renal papillary necrosis to consider include diabetes mellitus, analgesics, and acute palinephritis. But if you see an exam question and they mention an African-American patient and, you know, they had recurrent hospitalizations of chronic pain or even pneumonia, and they also ha- are having painless gross hematuria with numerous intact red blood cells, think about the fact that this patient might have the sickle cell trait and they're experiencing um, renal papillary necrosis. If you see a question with a patient that has palpable purpura, arthralgias, and abdominal pain, I want you to think about Hinox-Shanline purpura. This is also known as an IgA vasculitis, and patients are typically less than 10 years old, and these patients typically can present during the fall and winter months. It can be associated with preceding upper respiratory infection. So just remember, joint pain or, or arthralgias, colicky abdominal pain, hematuria, think about hinox shanline purpura. And when you do a physical exam, you might find symmetric palpable non-tender purpura on the buttocks and lower extremities. And this is typically the first sign of disease, and it may even spread from the lower extremities to the upper extremities. Physical exam may even reveal abdominal tenderness on palpation. To treat these patients, of course, you need supportive measures such as hydration and address their pain. Um, You can give them NSAIDs and also to treat with steroids if their condition is severe. Let's do a quick bonus question. Let's say a patient presents with fever, anemia, thrombocytopenia, renal failure, and neurological symptoms. What's the most likely diagnosis in these patients? If you said thrombotic, thrombocytopenic, purpura, then you are absolutely correct. Posterior urethral valves. This is the most common cause of urinary tract obstruction in newborn boys. Classic findings of prenatal ultrasound include bladder distension, and bilateral hydronephrosis. This condition does not occur in girls. So if you see a presentation of a a newborn girl and they have posterior urethophiles as a um, possible answer choice for whatever urinary symptoms they're experiencing, this would not be the answer. Basical urethral reflux. This is the likely diagnosis in a young girl that presents with recurrent UTI since birth with bilateral focal parenchymal scarring and blunt calluses on imaging. 